All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening in uh, for hashtag BKOT, build a kick-ass offshore team. Uh, we're on episode 41. And today we have an awesome guest out of Calgary, Canada, and now in Alberta, uh, Laura Bouchard, and she's the owner of ProVision Business Advisors. Lauren, Laura, excuse me, thank you so much for taking time out today and joining us. How's everything going? Oh, you're welcome, Chris. My pleasure to join you today. Things are going pretty great. We've got a nice dusting of snow, so it's looking like Christmas here in Alberta. Well, man, yeah, it's been ice cold here in, in New York, not uh, not normal, but it's that time of the year. Uh, but it always reminds us to visit family and, and enjoy this uh, as we wrap up this year, 2021. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot's going on with, uh, with staffing. <clears throat> Excuse me, as I... Um, I usually get 10 calls a day and speaking to clients all throughout North America and 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 staffing is a, uh, it's always been a challenge but this year is unique where there's just simply no talent. So today we want to talk about you know um human performance and hiring and managing people to achieve higher firm performance, right? So but first I want you to talk a little bit about um how uh, your business and how you got started and what you do for clients. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Chris. So ProVision Business Advisors is a boutique consulting firm here in Calgary, Alberta, and we, we work with CPA firms in helping them drive their firm performance by leveraging their talent. And, and so that's one of the core programs that we offer is practice management uh, program, specifically looking at their, their people talent and how do they really specifically leverage that talent to get more results. I'm a CPA myself by background with an MBA in finance and also a master's in education. And I got into this work really because um, I saw it over and over with my colleagues that are CPAs that were in public practice that were complained bitterly about the, the hiring this top talent and then not getting the performance that they expected from them. And so this was uh, seemed to be a really niche area that we could specialize in. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, um, I don't think a lot of firms kind of uh, evaluate their talent and, 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 and identify, you know, maybe they're, uh, there's, they could do some reskilling or upskilling per se. I mean, how do you go about, um, when you meet with a firm, uh, what, what's kind of the first things that you're doing, um, and, and helping them out with their talent? The, the, really, the first thing we do is, uh, is figure out where they're at and what kind of processes they do have. Um, because if you know, one of the things that we realize is whatever results we're getting, good, bad, or indifferent, it's because of what we have been doing. And some of those things that we have been doing have been working for us and some things have not been working for us. And so it really, it's that diagnostic because what we do at the very beginning is, is working with the uh, often the managing partner or the partners of the firm, or if there's an office manager, we often include it as well in the initial conversations to really look at the diagnostics of what, why are we not getting the performance that we, we anticipate getting in the firm. Uh, and then we, from there, once we've isolated the potential, we've guessed, we perceive that what we think the initial constraint is, then we can look at designing the important the performance improvement initiatives that are aligned to that constraint. And so, how, how I'm uh, curious to know when you're approaching this with a firm and they have uh, a very loyal group, right? We're talking maybe 15 years, 20 years, because I see that quite a bit. And 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 also they're starting to infuse some some youth, so maybe some interns and some uh, graduates as, as well. Um, how do you see kind of the the response from uh, these 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 loyal associates to them? And are they really receptive? Are they um, uh, open to change? Or, or I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? We, we definitely have diversity in the profession and some are open to change and some are not open to change. So some are, some are, some are saying, thank goodness, it's about time that we made some of these changes. Yeah. And of course, others are, are just very comfortable in doing this, doing what they have been doing and really aren't looking to embrace any changes. So we have the same diversity in, in the younger demographic as we do in the, in those, those loyal long-term individuals. Well, and what historically we have been attracting to the accounting profession in general are people who really don't like change. 
um, you know, we like we like to we it's a, when the income tax act changes or you know there's something else that changes we're we're more okay with that. But when other things change, we're we're not really too great about that. We like process. We like knowledge. We they often want to be perfectionists, and so when things change too much. It throws a you know can kind of throw quite the wrench into their into the the way they have been managing their practice when there mm -hmm. are changes. So uh, the, the the profession is attracting more uh, people that are not so much that you know process orientated individual, but historically that's who's been attracted into the profession. Right. Yeah. No. Um, change is constant. Uh, whether if you've been doing the same thing for 20, 30 years, that's awesome. Right. It's working, but. Yeah, what I've seen at some point in time, there's going to be an adjustment. There's going to be, you have to adapt. Something's going to happen, right? We just had this um, in, insane um, uh, pandemic just go on and really put um, you know the eyes on the virtual remote environment, uh, which the accounting industry was just thrusted into, right? I, I remember myself when I used to say the word remote or virtual four years ago, starting this, I mean, 50% of my calls would end. Um, yeah. Have yeah, you... and they and they and they really had to adapt, accept change from the technological perspective, yeah. right? So you know, it used to be you know, it used to be this their servers and and their desktop computers, and so they've had to really transition and accept a lot of change from a systems perspective, uh, and so they're you know they're they're almost they've almost they've almost had enough change fatigue because the tech stack <laughs> keeps changing, and that that's enough. No, no more change. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I see it all the time, and and you could love technology, you could hate it, you got to embrace it because uh, it's the reason why we're here today too. I mean, and and so uh, I I completely understand that. So now, when uh, working with a firm, do you find that when um, uh, they're they're kind of uh, advanced in that technology space and have a solid tech stack in place, it's easier to work with? Or do you find that um, uh, could be challenging? Or do you find that firms that are you know, adopting to more of the technology piece um, is, uh, is a little bit easier, a little bit harder to work with? Or can you share your thoughts on that? Well, some of the initial things was, was, that we look at is really a, a kind of a change readiness sort of assessment. So we look at how, or how ready is the organization for change. And so it does look at factors like how many changes have been implemented in this organization in, in the last little while and how well did those go? Because if the, if the organization has a lot of experience with failed change attempts, then it's very difficult to come in with another you know, flavor of the week kind of thing. And, and people will roll their eyes and say, oh, yeah, let's see how long this one lasts. Uh, and so it, it really we do start with that sort of sizing and that sort of how ready is the organization for change. Uh, and then really, it's really that strategic, how do we roll this out? How do we socialize it? What's the communication? Because before we have, before we can implement any changes, we have to make sure that we have done the planning effectively, we've done the readiness effectively before we start implementing any of these changes. And, and so it's, if you want the change to actually stick, sometimes you have to go a little slower than you normally would want to go because we do have competing priorities. We still have to get the files out the door. We still have to get the latest patch on our and, and the update on our tech system and with that integration that's not working. And so it's it's not the only thing on anybody's plate at any time. And that's where sometimes it goes off the rails is is unrealistic expectations of how quickly can we implement these changes and get the intended results. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And and when uh, it's got to have the right mindset too, so that's that's always a starting point. But now, what uh, what do you what um, as far as hiring and managing, right? What do you think could be more difficult, or are they equally difficult to kind of implement, or which one should someone focus on more um, than the other, or they, do they get equal treatment? I, I'm curious to know about that. Well, when we talk about these constraints that can be be dampening firm performance. Um, you know, then we look at how do we drive profitability in our firms? Well, we, we drive them, of course, through focus on sales and the revenue generation and the cross-selling and the upselling and what are our, what are our services that we're offering and advisory versus compliance. And we have all of those conversations. Then we can look at costs and our expenses. And how do we control those? But the other two levers are productivity and cash flow. 
And so when we look at productivity and what's constraining the human performance of productivity, we have three primary buckets where those where performance gets constraints. And one is opportunity. So it's sort of people are there and available to work, but there's no work for them to do. So if you if you go to work and there's nothing for you to do and you twiddle your thumbs all day, well, you're unproductive. So you're not you're not moving that firm forward. So that's usually the first one we look at, because if it's an opportunity constraint, that's the easiest one to fix if it's an opportunity constraint. So when we think about the second bucket, which is really the capability, that's where we're looking at things like hiring. So not only are we hiring the right individuals, the right process, and then do we have an employee development program plan that's going to take that intern and develop them in a way that's intentional through to develop their competencies as a higher level uh, technician in the firm and ultimately maybe into a management role uh, that we look at work processes as part of that we look at resources so you know what what's what's act is there a capability constraint here that then we can look at so if, if we find out and often when I am working with professional firms I find out they hire based on experience or technical skills rather than personality value culture fit mm -hmm. and then they then they end up with wrong hires so they haven't focused initially on getting the individual that who will be a good fit for the firm given the culture and everyone else in the firm and what the, what their values are and so they may have people with great technical skills but yeah. they don't fit and so those people you know are going to damage the culture in the firm if they stay on and so when you do the opposite and you're you're finding the great people and the good fit for people because many of the times if we've got a good development program we can develop we can fill the skill gaps a lot faster than we can fill the culture gap hmm. so, well so that's, said yeah, yeah I agree. so so that's a, that's sort of where the hiring comes in and if yeah. it's so, if, so if it's not a capability problem, then we look at that third bucket, which is the environment or the context with, with, with that performance takes place in, uh, and that's where we look at uh, work groups. So, like, is the if you're wanting a certain performance to occur, our peers or our colleagues dampening that behavior, um, our supervisors or leaders dampening that behavior, or are they helping improve the behavior? So are we getting good feedback? Are we actually, do people know what they're supposed to be doing? Are we good at setting expectations? Are we good at telling our employees not only what we want them to do, but the constraints that they need to work within that? So you give them a bookkeeping file and just say, do the bookkeeping, but you don't say it should take you approximately this many hours. And then you get the billable hours, which are off the charts. And so you haven't given them enough detail around the performance that's expected. So they meet your expectations. Uh, mm -hmm. And so in that category, we're looking at more leadership training, management training, mm -hmm. um, teaching, into, teaching managers how to have accountability conversations, teaching them how to have good conversations at the beginning to set clear expectations. We're talking things like job aids and reminders and checklists. And you know, what are the kinds of things that we can give our employees so that they have a better chance of meeting the expectations that we have for performance? Uh, and so, so, so it's not sort of an either or managing yeah. or hiring. It actually might be both, or it may right. be one. It may be one or the other. Wow! No, that that um, I find that fascinating. And one thing, one takeaway I get is the employee development. I think that's spot on, especially now is more important than ever, because mm -hmm. it, and and just from experience and speaking with firms, especially in um, uh, smaller cities, that. They uh, do the uh, recruiting and the and they bring them on board and then two years they leave and then they start the cycle again and then yeah that 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 has a bad effect as far as the the culture there and and then just kind of burnout for the firm owner or the the, uh, the uh, uh, managing partner whoever's you know kind of in charge of that onboarding yeah. and so when when especially now when a firm they have to make themselves very attractive to work for, I believe, because it's a new mindset with millennials, Gen Z um, coming into play here. And it's more about, you know, what can your firm do for me? And why should I work for your firm? It's no longer about, you know, um, I got 
160 hours a week and I had the most billable hours and that type of mindset's gone. And so the key thing with employee development, um, it, you, you, you want to make your firm very attractive. And so having those, um, having awareness on that and then, yeah, what can you do for the employees? Yeah, um, and, that, and that's sort of where my, let's say the, the master's in education comes in, right? Because that yeah. employee development, the teaching, the learning and you know, I'm having conversations with my one of my clients just last week, and and I joined her and two of her employees, and she says, Can, you know, "Will you come and have a let's have a career conversation?" So we're not having a conversation with her employees, and she's a firm of five bookkeepers, technical people, not huge, uh, you know, single owner, and we're having conversations with the receptionist about her career path, like where do you yeah. see yourself in the firm, and. And then we're having conversations with another, you know, junior, new grad finance. Where do you see yourself in the firm? Because, you know, as the owner, she says, well, if you want to be doing X or Y, now my job is to make sure that works there for you because I want to retain you. I want to keep you. I, you know, I don't want you to, to get really good in your job and then quit because there's no place for you to go in the organization. So if I know what you want to do, now my job is to make sure that works there and ready for you when you're ready to do it. Totally different mm -hmm. mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then now um, the talent is, is um, um, uh, uh, again, speaking with clients, they're either very underqualified or, I mean, they're just overqualified and, and there's not, there's none of that, uh, that, um, um, and that someone in the middle that can grow and develop within a firm. It's either, you know, polar opposites now. And so uh, what's brought into light about uh, a huge spotlight in regards to offshore staffing. And so uh, where do you see kind of offshore staffing? Where do you see it now and going forward and, and potentially integrating um, into firms? Offshore staffing really isn't new. We're just seeing it right. in, in more and more different areas. I mean, right. uh, I mean, lots of industries have been doing it for a long time. Uh, and then when we're looking at service-based industries, we have the luxury of not actually having to set up a headquarters in another country, uh, whereas with manufacturing, you've had to really build a plant and invest significantly in other countries. So, I mean, for me, talent is talent. And whether it's offshore talent or it's domestic talent, it's talent. And, and people are people. And we do need to make sure that we are bringing out the best in our people and we do that by actually getting to know our people, by yeah. getting to form relationship with, with our individuals. Uh, and I think, you know, historically, some of our, some of our professional service firms and our CPA firms have not, have, treated, have not treated their people well. I've just, you know, there's a dime a dozen and I can replace you next tomorrow. And, you know, the old, the old, uh, you know, the old articling being, being equated to slavery and, oh. you know, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm working for nothing and I'm putting yeah. in all these hours. And, and so, I mean, like whether it's a lot, like lead, the legal profession has been the same. Like it's the, these articling students, we've always, it's, it's sort of the rite of passage. Like you have to be treated like crap to be able to get through the professional program and, and then it's almost, well, that's the way it is. So then when, when you're in that position, you're doing the same thing to the next generation that's coming up and no one really likes it. And right. there isn't, there is no scientific data to back up that if you treat people badly, you're going to get optimum performance out of them. Uh, and so like, why do we continue to do this? Why do we continue to not invest in our people to really not give them a reason to stay and grow and develop our firms. And the, you know, the approach that we've been taking to managing a number of, of, of our individuals has been, you know, we're getting work to rule, we're getting compliance, we're getting minimum performance out of them. And we're, we're not getting that discretionary effort that's going to really get our firms performing above the industry average. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And um, I, I love what you said, you know, talent's talent and, and being in this remote virtual environment uh, has made everyone realize you could hire in outside your city, heck, outside your state or province and shoot outside your country. Right. And so, yeah, it, it's made everyone realize. But the key thing is, is, as we've been talking about, it's one team. Right. You don't want to create barriers or create, you know, domestic and offshore type of uh, battles 
by any means. It's all one team and everybody's working together for the firm's goal or vision and what they want to do for the future. And I believe if you have that type of uh, environment, you know, everyone's going to want to stay. Everyone's going to be happy. You have the right development in place for the employees. They see themselves growing within the firm. Uh, now, you know, you're very attractive to uh, to work for. And it's like, hey, I want to work for your firm, right? And so, yes. and especially in that small to mid-sized market. Yeah, you're going to be known as the firm where people grow to be developed, not the firm where people go to die. <laughs> Right. Spot yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. And, and so do you want to be the firm that takes A players and generates A plus players? Or do you want to be yes. the firm that takes A players, turns them into A minus players, then but now right. attracts B players? So it's it's very much your culture. And people are shopping around, as you say. Uh they're they're checking out the the firm's the firm's culture is is yep. just as important yep. as the experience that people are going to get there. Mm -hmm. And and people are more aware of the options they have. And yep. how mobile people are far more mobile um, and virtual work, whether we're talking about it being offshore or domestic, virtual work is really exploding, as we all know. And even in my yeah. practice, I, you know, if I if I restricted my practice to only working with firms that are in my geographic area, uh, it, yeah. would, it would limit the ability to grow my firm. And so, you know, we can work with firms globally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the whole idea. Um, uh, really, uh, this is really good insight. I appreciate your time and, and joining, uh, joining us today in our audience and giving some insight into this and invest in your people, right? And, and work with your people. And it's more important than ever and treat them right, treat them fairly. And if you do that, then, you know, you're, you're, you'll have loyal staff and, and for as, as, as long as it may be. Uh, if, but you, if, if you don't, if you don't want to be self-employed, then the survival and the success of your firm depends on your people. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Um, before we leave, though, uh, any final thoughts to, to share with our audience today? But this has been really good. But any final thoughts? Uh, no, I think just because people are preparing to get into their into into busy busy seasons and busy times. I mean, we're always happy to to dip, to have a to have a conversation to give you that little, that one or two little things that you could maybe do to have a little less pain through some of those busy seasons. So feel free to, to reach out and connect with us and happy yes. to build a conversation and, and just wishing everyone a happy holidays and whatever you celebrate, be safe and yes. uh, have a happy, happy and prosperous 2022. Yes, absolutely. Laura, thank you so much for taking time out. Everyone, please check out ProVision Business Advisors. Uh, the services that she provides extremely valuable. I really had a fun conversation today, learning some things myself. Again, thank you for taking time out for everyone else. We'll be back with another episode soon. And for now, take care. Be good.